Hello, and welcome to yet another episode of John Works Too Much. You're probably thinking to yourself, self, where in the world has John been all week? I haven't really heard from you. Sorry, I've been busy. I've been digging a lake and acting and editing and a bunch of things that are probably boring to you. And I've been, you know, experiencing loneliness as I'm in the habit of doing. Anyway, um, <laughs> today um, I'm over here at a friend's house and we're gonna take out this wall. Look over here. We're gonna take out this wall right up here and take all this out and then down here. And we've already checked and it's not a low drain wall, so we're gonna hope that this does not collapse on us. But <laughs> this is only my second time doing this and my first time did not go so good. Uh, then we're also gonna build another wall behind that, put in new cabinets, take these cabinets out and rearrange just everything. It's gonna be beautiful by the time we're done. But uh, we got a time frame because I got to act in something tonight, so we best hurry. And uh, I'm not good at that. We only have like a couple 28 minute segments to work on things today. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you about uh, you reap what you sow. Okay, now a lot of us are not farmers. I know I'm not a farmer. If you want something to die of neglect, give it to me, whether it be animal, vegetable, or people. It will definitely die of neglect. You'd be like, wow, you didn't do anything with that. Nevertheless, so we're not an agricultural society and we hear reap what you sow and it just sounds like something we say and we're like, well, I don't know what that means. <clears throat> but imagine that you're a farmer, okay? And then you're like, I'm gonna sow some seeds. So you got like a bunch of seeds and you sow them, you throw them all over the place. And then you spend all day long, you're exhausted by the end of the day, like I went through so many bags of seeds, like I'm worn out. And you go home and you take a shower because you need to, because you smell horrible. And then, you know, you go to sleep and you wake up and you look outside and you're like, hmm, nothing. Like literally nothing. There's no change, just a bunch of seeds on the ground. Like, huh, what a waste of my time. So here's the problem, is that a smart farmer knows, look man, you give it some time and like the rain's gonna come and the sun's gonna rise and fall a few times and then pretty soon you're gonna see little shoots come up and then, you know, when time passes, you're gonna have a harvest, right? Um, but so because we're such an instant gratification society, you know, we look out and we say, I did something good today, right? I decided I'm gonna turn over a new leaf. I started dieting for seven whole minutes and look, no change, okay? And so we look out the window and go, I did a good thing and there is no results. What a waste of my time. I'm done with this. Or the inverse, we do something bad and we look out and we go, no consequence. I can do literally anything I want and it makes no difference. But if you give it time, you'll notice that your deeds will catch up to you. And by the time you realize it's a problem, it will have engulfed you to the point that you cannot get away with it. And the same is true, like you just keep doing good things and you're like, I don't know, there's no result, but you know, I just, I like doing good stuff because I don't know, it feels good. And then all of a sudden you realize like, I am so overwhelmingly blessed that my deeds, and the, I read this in the Bible this week, the deeds of the righteous follow them into heaven. Okay. To the point where you go, man, I don't even remember doing that thing. But then there's the results of it. And you're like, wow, you're here. And they're like, yeah, because of you. I'm like, who did I ever say anything to you? Like, well, you did. Remember this conversation? I'm like, huh. Well, who'd have thunk it? Anyway, the point is this. Do good things. It matters. Don't do bad things. It also matters. All right. Hope you have a wonderful day. We're going to tear some stuff up. Whoa. Huh. Just like movie magic, this wall has disappeared. Now, you probably noticed that we do not have a beam up in here. Okay? So... Uh, I show you guys how to put a lot of beams in. This one does not need a beam because this was not a low bearing wall. And I'm sure that you guys hear that word a lot, words, a uh, term a lot, and you probably think to yourself, self, what does that even mean? Well, let me tell you. So imagine that you got a wall sitting here, right? So this wall is like this, and then you got ceiling joists, which are usually two by six or two by four, they come and rest on that wall. And then other ones that come and rest on that wall, so they're both like this on top of that wall. Then you take this wall out, and what's gonna happen? A different kind of scissoring, not the kind that you like. Um, <clears throat> so then because this does not have that, there's no weight on this. So these have uh, pre-engineered trusses, which means they come up like this and they got, you know, ziggy zaggies. And so that takes weight on the exterior walls and where this happens to be, there's not anything. So we're like in the middle and this lands on other walls. So this does not need anything. It's not going to fall or sag or anything like that. And that is a non low bearing wall. So hopefully you guys learned something amazing because of that also we got this wiring that we route let me just show you how this works okay so i got my electrician coming out here to deal with this and basically what happens is you've got hot power coming from your breaker box okay 
you got hot power going out to the rest of the circuit. And then this one, see I've got it tagged like this with a, like a loop? That goes to the light, okay? So this is from a switch. This was all in a switch right here, right? So you got all your hots on one side and then all your, well, your one leg up to your light on the other side. And then you twist all your whites together and all your grounds together uh, because that's how switches work. And then from there, then you would go to whatever outlets. And I think there was two in this wall. So we uh, had our electrician deal with that. And now hopefully you guys learned something. Now we're gonna tear out some cabinets. <laughs> oh, hey there, come on closer. So as you can clearly tell from my diagram, we have um, taken out this wall. We showed you that earlier, and it's beautiful, right? It didn't sag, and that's important. But then we rebuilt all this stuff. And so let me show you what this is for. We've got some pantries, right? These are pre-made from Home Depot. They're gonna pan themselves. And these fit right in here like this. So then you have a wall all around it, and one over here, and then the fridge will go right in here. And so um, it's funny how life works, and maybe you guys are thinking the same thing too, but um, I was sitting there thinking, I should make a video showing how, uh, why you put these studs everywhere. Do you know why? Kevin? Kevin's pretty smart. Everybody know Kevin? It's, it's, it's called for building walls. It's for building walls. Okay, so that's right. But let's get a little bit more detailed because sometimes people, you know, that's a little vague for people, <laughs> but very good, very smart. You're going places. All right, so um, come, come on closer here. Let's take a look. So here's why there's so many, like you look at this wall and go, why are there so many studs here, okay? And it's gonna help you find studs if you're like hanging nails and things like that too. You always have to have one on the side, the outside, right? That makes sense. You have to have one on the inside, and that's a nailer, right? Because you have to have sheetrock that nails into something. But why are these here? Why are there two here? Because these are nailers for this side, right? So when you have sheetrock here, then you got a nailer for this one. So anytime you have a wall, you gotta have a stud on either side of it um, so that you can have sheetrock nailed there, right? Uh, there's a double stud at the top. You always have a double header up there, so um, that's important. And then once again here, you have to have one on one side, one on the outside, right? Then one for a nailer, another one for a nailer. This is nailers for this wall. And then on average, for a low-bearing wall, every 16 inches, right? So that would be 16-inch centers. Now this one, we're like a little more, but it's not even a low-bearing wall, so it doesn't matter because of where the wall lands. So that's more of a whatever. Um, if it's not a load bearing wall, they do 24 inches. Um, but this is not like a hard fast rule. Sometimes if you're like, Hey, this is 16 and this is 16 and a half or whatever. You're like, it's not gonna make any difference. Okay. So, uh, Kevin, you got anything you want to talk about? I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hear it. Come on. What's the point of the double header? The point of double header. Okay. So here's why. Imagine now this wall is not really taking weight, but imagine that you've got a wall that is holding your roof, okay? Or your ceiling at least. And so you've got one board here, right? And you got studs, but then your rafters or your joists land in between studs. And with all that weight, and it's a lot of weight, it would start to sag that board in the middle. So with a double header, right? And then every 16 inches, then you got something nice and solid. Um, and then you don't want to make your, your seams like right on top of each other. You want to stagger your seams right. um, so that you have more strength, right? And then another thing too, is whenever you're hanging sheetrock, usually you hang your ceiling first, Okay, and then you come up long ways and then nail it because then you're hitting more studs and then stagger that over. I mean, obviously this wall doesn't count, but if it's a long wall, then you would start up high, right up smack against the, the ceiling and that keeps the ceiling from falling. But then also at the floor, there should be like an inch gap because you don't want water to wick up in your sheetrock and run. All right, but that's technical stuff, but you got anything you want to talk about? Like what's on your heart? Weight, life. Life and weight, right? So we were talking about this earlier. Is it okay if I share? Sure. Okay, so um, we were talking about the fact that a lot of us carry fear and anxiety, right? Um, a fear of death and knowing like, I feel like I'm not gonna, it, like a panic almost, right? And that can be a hard, heavy load to carry. And I think a lot of people carry that right now. I mean, if you imagine, you know, a hundred years ago or something, you would just, I don't know, like, I exist and that's my job is to just exist like but now there's just such with our modern conveniences we've got so many things that we're responsible for that we just feel this constant panic and stress of like I've got to do all this stuff and if I don't then I'm gonna get left behind or something like that right and we gotta like let that go <laughs> yeah you gotta, you gotta find your peace gotta find your center um, <clears throat> and so we were talking about what is the opposite of anxiety and fear right anybody know correct Faith is the opposite, right? So if you have faith and hope, you have faith that like God's got you 
and that you're going to be taken care of. You're not afraid to die. You know that he's got you in his hands. Um, and you've got hope that knows, like, it's going to get better. It may get worse, right? But it's going to get better. It probably will get worse. I mean, if we're being honest, right? You're going to have to deal with some pain. That's, that's life is pain. And every one of us deserves it. And I can say that because I'm part of it. It's like when a black person uses the N-word, right? It's, that's the same thing as me saying we all deserve it because I'm one of us and I deserve it too. So um, we're going to have to deal with some pain. But at the end of this, we've got so much glory. I think that if we knew how short of time we had left here, right? And, and every one of us, that's a different number. But how many minutes or how many days or how many years we have left here, um, some people would be discouraged by that. They say, I deserve more. And you're like, but this is, this is not where it ends. This is, this is not the end of the road. This is not the end of the story, right? So if you knew that that's all you got is that one last sprint, man, make that count, right? Like do something that matters with your life. Um, be an inspiration to people. Like do hard work, do good work. You've got, your needs are gonna be provided for. Trust me, like, I've been to Africa, I've been to third world countries, Mexico, all kinds of places. And these people survive somehow. And you will too, but make your life count. So anyway, we're going to get back to doing some more work because that's what I do. And I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Love you. Bye. Amen. Right. Hey, Are you guys still here watching me? I love that. Uh, come on in. So what we did today uh, is a short day because you can see the sun's still shining, but I got to go act in the thing tonight, which I'm excited about. We got all this wall out. We got everything framed up. Uh, we had our electrician and our plumber come in and they took care of all the plumbing and electrical, which was, I'm so grateful for that. Um, the, in this particular case, uh, everybody's budget conscious, and so I help them get over the hump, and then they're going to finish the rest themselves. So I hope they make another video and follow up and say, look at our beautiful kitchen and what we do with it. So that would make me very happy. Now I want to talk to you guys about the story of Jonah. I realize more and more every day that probably a lot of you don't regularly you read your Bible. It's easy for me to say the word. Um, and also probably not a lot of you are even familiar with Bible stories anymore because we're kind of in a post-Christian era. And this makes me sad. So I tell you stories because they're great stories and there's a great lesson in there to learn. So the story of Jonah is that God calls Jonah and says, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach to these people. They're heathens, right? They're bad people. And I want you to preach to them and tell them the destruction of God is coming to you if you don't repent. And so Jonah in his heart says, man, God, then you're just going to save those people, and they're bad people. I don't really want to. And so he runs from God. He's straight up, and this is in the Bible. This is like a, a hero of the Bible. He runs from God. He's like, I don't want to do. I don't want to do that. No. Hmm. Kicks his foot, pounds spot, or whatever. And so <clears throat> then he tries to run from God, thinking I could get away from God. And he won't find me over here. And so he gets on a boat, and he's like, I'm going to sail to the far end of the world. God won't find me there. Incorrect. <laughs> While he's on this boat, this huge storm comes to the point where everybody on the boat is like, seriously, who did something wrong? Because this storm is ridiculous. This isn't just a storm. This is like, and so everybody's asking questions and Jonah's like, it was me. And they're like, what did you do that was so bad? Like, what did your God do that was so bad? Like, this is real stuff. And he's like, I'm running from God right now. He told me to go save the Ninevites and I won't do it. And they're like, are you kidding me right now? What are we supposed to do? We run in the middle of the ocean. And it's like, you ought to throw me over. And so they're like, okay. And they throw him over. And what happens? The storm just whew, is gone, right? But right after they throw him over, this giant fish or whale just oh, swallows Jonah whole. And you're like, what are the odds of that? He's in the belly of this whale for three whole days. <clears throat> and finally, he's down there, you know, praying, repenting because he's in a bad place. And uh, realizes like, wow, I can't really run from God. Maybe I should stop running from my calling, which that's a good lesson for you guys. And then this whale vomits him up onto the shore. What shore do you think it is? Anybody take a guess? Kevin? The shore of? Tahiti. Close, Nineveh. <laughs> so, <laughs> this whale apparently has some GPS that God had provided, and he comes and is like, let me just take you right to where you were trying to run away from, and bleh. And so he gets out, and God's like, are you going to do what I say now? And Jonah's like, fine. Which is another good lesson. Why in the world do you want to like begrudgingly do what God wants you to do? Like, you're going to do it. Make it pleasant. Make it a good blessing for you, right? And for everybody else, instead of like, I'm going to trudge through this and cuss the whole way. Like, no, you can, I guess, but what a miserable life. Anyway, so he goes and he's like, I just know that you're going to save these bad people. 
And so he goes, and God's like, probably. So he goes, and he's like, there's 100,000 people in Nineveh. And he goes and preaches to them and says, you are all going to die. This city will be destroyed if you guys don't repent. And then what did they do? They repented. They're like, we don't want to be destroyed. We're heathens, but if you're coming to us with this story that you just got vomited up by a whale and you're in a whale's belly for three days, and that God is telling us we need to repent or else. Okay, we're going to repent. What do we need to do? And he's like, well, okay. And he gives them instructions. They're like, we want to do that. And they all repent, the whole city, 100,000 people. And they get saved. And you know what Jonah does? You're probably thinking, praises God and claps and sings? Incorrect. <laughs> he goes outside the city and pouts like, see, I told you, we're just going to save them anyway. Why would you even pick me? And you're like, Jonah, seriously, like, learn your lesson, dude. So then this, out of nowhere, this uh, bush comes and grows over top of him. And it's very hot, and it's a nice, shady bush. And he's like, huh, this isn't so bad. And the next day, the bush dies. And he's like, ooh, I'm so mad at God right now. And God's like, who do you think you are, dude? Who do you think you are? This bush I brought up in a day. And I destroyed in a day. And there are 100,000 people in that city who I love. Which is more important? Do what I want you to do. So here's my presentation to you guys. Do what you're called to do. If God is calling you to do something, stop making excuses. Stop running from God. Stop thinking like, aha, he won't catch me here. I won't have to do this. Or I'm going to skirt out of this. Like, why? Do what you need to do. It takes more effort to do the wrong thing than it does to do the right thing. It takes more effort to frown than it does to smile, right? It takes, I see people and they step over a dollar to pick up a dime. I'm like, do the easy thing, do the right thing. There's no way around this. You're gonna have to do it. Do it. Anyway, um, we're excited about this kitchen. I love getting to help people. I love you guys. I hope to see you soon. Have a great day.